Hi everybody, this is Tom here from Pro Writing Aid. Most of you know that we are running a series of monthly sessions now. Um, we're doing that for the writing community and have been doing really as a response to COVID-19. So I just, just to touch on what those are, on the first Tuesday of every month, we run our introduction to Pro Writing Aid session, or what we call Pro Writing Aid 101. And that's with Chris Banks, our CEO and founder, uh, and Lisa Lepke, who's the head of marketing. They talk you through the tool, answering questions, showing you how to get most out of it uh, when it comes to writing. The second Tuesday of the month is today. Um, so that's the session with Sally and myself, Sally OJ, OJ our, our resident book doctor. Uh, and I'll introduce Sally in a minute. Um, the third session, third Tuesday, sorry, third Tuesday of the month is our Ask a Writing Professor um, Q&A with AJ Ogilvie. Uh, AJ is Professor of Business Communications from uh, the University of Southern California um, and always presents an interesting session. And then on the fourth Tuesday of the month is our monthly writing. These are going fantastically well, really good fun. And that's with the author um, Hayley Milliman, who's one of the team here at Pro Writing Aid 2. Okay, um, just to help you with those, to see what's on the webinar coming up, webinar page, uh, I'll drop a link in the chat box. I'll also include a link to uh, our sign-up page. Um, that means you can stay in touch with everything we've got going on. Uh, that should be going out to you now. Um, so just stay up to date uh, uh, with the blogs that we post, with the content that we provide, and the events that we're running as well. So, hello everybody. Welcome to the second in our 12-part series of Ask a Book Doctor webinars. Uh, our guest for the entire series is Sally OJ. Most of you will know Sally well by now. Uh, she's our resident book doctor and has an impressive CV, uh, having worked with a huge range of authors, including the likes of Sarah Waters and Viv Albertine, and many, many, many uh, new authors too. Um, what you may not know is how Sally sounds, because last month we had such terrible audio issues <laughs> that you may not have been able to make out much of what she was saying. Fortunately, tonight, we fixed those problems. I'm delighted uh, that we were able to hear you loud and clear. Are you there, Sally? I am. And you know, we can always redo Show Don't Tell if, if people would like to, don't you think, at the end of the series? If yeah. If really couldn't hear. Yeah, absolutely. I think that'd be a great idea, Sally. Absolutely. So tonight, Sally, we're talking about characterization. Where do we begin by a, a kind of unpicking characterization? It's a critical part of the, the writing process. What, well, let's start with what does it mean? What does characterization mean? It means making sure that your characters come to life on the page. And um, if you ask most people what they think is the most important thing about a book, they'd say the plot, and actually they would be right. But if you've got a plot with stick figures walking through it, it's not going to be doing the plot justice. Yeah. Well, readers relate, of course, to the people in the book. They relate to the characters. So they have got to be as three-dimensional as you can possibly get them. And that's what characterization means. Uh, so is it difficult to get right, firstly? I think it depends very much. Excuse me motorbike going past I think it depends very much on what you're writing we're, we're doing a section on uh, we're doing a session on fan fiction later on in this series if you're if you're um, novelizing your fan fiction then characterization is almost bound to be a problem and we can get into that um, when we do the fan fiction thing um, it depends if you're writing genre fiction it depends on an awful lot of stuff it is difficult to get right often in a first novel because the first novel is very often um, a story that an author has been carrying around for a very long time. And the, these characters are so real to them in their head by the, put, that by the time they've come to put it down on paper, they might not realise that they're not getting them across as vividly as they can see them themselves. It can be difficult simply because no one's ever said to the author, your characters aren't really coming to life. So yeah. 
sometimes it's just a case of of awareness um okay. Okay, and I, I guess that with someone who's been carrying those characters around in the head for so long, with the ideas for this book burning away, then it, it's completely understandable they may not have that awareness again of what, how, how they really paint the picture for the audience and get them enthralled in, in, the, in the character. Okay, so when we talk characterization, Sally, are we referring to uh, main characters? Are we referring to everybody in a story? How do you, wh wh where do you draw the line? Who's it? You're specifically talking about your main, you know, there's usually four or five main characters. But truthfully, the more you can bring even your bit players to life, if you think of, if you think of TV series like, uh, you know, Grey's Anatomy or, or ER, even somebody who's, who's, who's just in the, in the program for 10 or 15 minutes, you get a very vivid sense of them and it helps to make, the book richer now of course we don't need the life stories of of somebody who delivers the mail in chapter 22 but it might be nice to know if he's grumpy because it's snowing or it might be nice to know that he's got little icicles on his moustache because it's so cold or you know something like that just to bring these people just to infuse all your characters with warmth that's what we're talking about and you do that right from the beginning, because obviously at the beginning of the book is where we see the action and dialogue to get the book, you know, to get readers enthralled from the beginning. So you should be introducing those elements early on before the, what, before the readers start to build their own picture. I guess. Yeah, it's a difficult balance sometimes to get right, because obviously you don't want, you know, Susan, 53, blonde haired, five foot two, open the door. You know, you don't want anything as, as crass as that. But you do want to make sure you get, not necessarily somebody's height unless it's going to be important, but you do want to make sure you get an idea of a person, an idea of how they look, an idea of their age, if it's, yeah, an idea of their age. In the first chapter, if you can, because what you don't want to do is get to chapter 14 and find out that you've built a picture of this person who's, you know, a, a rugged um, redhead with a, a you know a bristling moustache and and he's 42 and it turns out he's a bit of a pipsqueak of a 20 year old um, you know with very dark features so you know you've got to it's true that the reader will always build their own I've had authors say to me often no I didn't give much description because because readers always make up this is true they will yeah. you Hey, this guy is six foot three and he's got red hair and a beard and a reader will still picture them like you know Woody Allen if that's the idea that they've got but subconsciously they are taking in what you're saying so subconsciously they're not going to have a shock when you say on page 112 you know something relevant to, to their looks or their age or something so, so for you, Sally, as a book doctor, the, you know, the number of manuscripts you see, when do the alarm bells start ringing? How do you, because it must be a fine line between how much detail you include that is, you know, is important and how much actually is just, I guess, in your head about knowing the, the characters in your book. So where, where do the alarm bells start to ring when you see? Middle of the book. Because you suddenly, you know, you don't expect it all to come together at first. You know, it's all sorts of things are playing out. But truthfully, if it does all come together at first, you don't even notice. You just take that in and you carry that rich character with you through the book. But if I get to the middle of a, of a plot and, and your heroine is, is, you know, has gone off on this search to try and find her dad, and I think... I don't really know anything. Why is she doing this? I'm not even sure, you know, why was she so happy to see that? It, it's not about their story. It's about their character. So you've got to have a sense of, actually, I didn't explain that very well. I'm sorry. I didn't give it. Sorry. But, you know, you've got to have a sense of, of what, you don't want this stick figure, this sort of line drawing walking through your book you want a fully fleshed colorful character 
that you think, yeah, my aunt Susan's just like that, or you think, yeah, you know, and I remember my brother saying that something, something that a real person, you want a real yeah. person on the page. And if you get to the middle of the book and you suddenly realize, I don't know any more about this person than I did on the first page, that's when the alarm bell, bell starts to ring. I, I like that description of a, a stick figure and, and I think I've heard it used kind of that you want that technicolor version, don't you? you want... I've said that to you before, yeah. Yeah. All, all dancing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and I, I guess it, it must be, it, it's difficult though, right, for an author who is so wrapped up in their story because they know it to to possibly see it from a reader's perspective. So I guess is that that's a, must be a skill of a book doctor and an edit, a good editor, right? Being able to spot, okay, well, actually, you, we don't know enough about this character to make us, you know, uh, interested in them or understand where they fit. Yeah, that's really right. You need to know enough about them to care. Yeah. Otherwise, who cares about her finding her father? What, you know, big deal. So... So what are the steps are? What, how, how do you, what are the steps to perfecting characterization? Is there, how do you advise your, your, your budding authors? Is there a process you suggest they follow? Do you use templates? Yes, and I'm sure most of the people here tonight actually will be familiar with it. Nearly always, I, w I will always ask an author, have you done this? And half the time they'll say, oh, I know I should have done, but I didn't. Um, so it's something that nearly everyone is aware of. You need to, at the same time as you're planning your book, so at the same time that you're planning the structure of the book and the, all of that, you need to sit down, you need to spend a day or two on characterization, or three, as long as it takes. And you need to make sit down and write out at least a page on each character even the peripheral ones, if you can. And I don't just mean George is 25, he's blonde, he's got grey eyes, he's um, a bit overweight. Um, I'm, I'm talking about much more, much, much more in-depth stuff. And nearly all of this will not find its way into the book. But if you write this about each character, it will in, you will know this about the character. You will know that his hobby is coin collecting and you will know that he loves Beethoven and you will know that he's got a bit of a dodgy knee that happened when he was playing football when he was 12. And this will creep in to the story because you will know it. Uh, and not literally, I'm not saying you'll, you'll say, oh, excuse me, I've got a dodgy knee that um, happened when I was 12. But you might find that when he's running for a bus, he limps and you can sort of, it, it just, it just, all this stuff that you put on that page and, and absorb about each character will find its way into the story, even if you aren't literally putting it in the story. Okay, so, so we've got kind of the obvious things, the physical attributes, the, the backstory, it's, it's just really kind of almost creating a mini miniature story or something about each person right so you've got that well so there's the obvious things there's the key characteristics you know the name what do they look like the hair eyes all this kind of stuff but you know you you can go a lot deeper even with that you can think about you know do they hear well the the, the key is to make each character individual just like people that we know if all the there's a basically the same. If all the characters are basically one big character sort of cut into five, that's going to make the book much poorer. I don't mean poor quality. I mean less rich. Yeah. So, you know, think about things like, you know, is he a bit hard? Not the obvious person to be hard of hearing, I mean. Like maybe somebody had whooping cough when they were a child or mumps or something. What about their complexion? Have they got acne? Is, have they got good skin? Are they bothered about it? What about the color of their skin? You know, diversity is important. Uh, body type, are they tall? Are they small? If they are tall, do they carry that or do they slouch a bit to hide it? And then you've got the vital facts, things like where are they? Obviously, how old are they? The 
but then you can take them that further as well. It, it's really good to know somebody's birthday because right. they somehow creep into the book. Um, obvious things that people don't really think about often. Are they gay? Are they straight? What's their heritage? Are they rich? Are they poor? You know, um, what do yeah. they do for a living? And then you get into the much more deep tissue stuff. Are they honest? Are they moral? Are they generous? Are they kind? Are they empathetic? Do they listen when other people are speaking or do they just want to get their own point across? Are they arrogant? Are they self-deprecating? Are they passive aggressive? That's always a very interesting one to put into the story. Um, you know, yeah. what are their hobbies? You know, things like that. And, um, you know, life, you know, lifestyle stuff. Are they religious? Do they have a sense of humor? And then you get into, you know, how do they talk? Um, you know, I often say to people, you know, all the characters sound the same and they sometimes people solve this problem by, um, you know, having somebody with a Scottish accent and another person, you know, and, and that is actually one way of solving it. You just, but another way is to just listen to people when they talk and make sure that people have got their own voice. You want to look at a page and take the names off the page and think that's George speaking, that's Caroline speaking. And that's easier said than it sounds actually, easier done than it sounds, I should say, sorry. Because if you start listening to, you know, somebody will always say, no, I mean, at the end of a sentence, of course, you can't do that over and over again. That would assault the eyes. But, you know, you know, I mean, yeah. um, somebody else might have a bit of a, 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 a talk in the way that is if they come from Ireland or something. So, yeah, all so there are infuses, infuses the characters with life. Yeah. So there are traits that you can introduce through dialogue as well as. Mm. Um, to description um, but making these character lists is so important and as I said I've, I hear so many people say to me oh I know I should have done but I haven't well you should have done yeah it, it shows that you didn't and, and I, I've seen I have seen a couple of templates I know um, I think it's Jerry Jenkins who, who's a, a, a we're big fans of his and, and we do a lot of work with him uh, I think he's got a template um, about there's lots online you can find them anywhere and and uh, th the other interesting thing about doing this is you often discover things about your characters that you you hadn't really realized before so it's a right. real shift in that way as well i like that okay so it's actually a good way yeah so it's it's a it's an important discipline from many points of view mm -hmm. yeah um, and do you find i mean but it, it but it's a skill right so i mean i think again uh, uh, you know we've got a, a big bunch of authors with us tonight great to have that everyone here but i guess for those who are, are, are newcomers maybe working on their first book it is something that gets easier over time or you get better at spotting whether you've got it right you know what i mean i think because it's a balance isn't it like try you know this you know you've heard of the rumsfeld box i think it's called is it yeah. you know unconsciously incompetent, consciously incompetent, consciously, com you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it does get easier over time. Somebody put up a Rumsfeld box. Of, look, at, look up Rumsfeld box afterwards. You'll see what I'm trying to say. Um, but, um, um, it does get easier over time, but I think if you stress too much about it, it's like everything with writing, then it becomes yeah. problematic. Um, I think, I think the main thing to do is just take the time to do it. If you're aware that it's something that's vitally important, that your readers are not going to know your characters as well as you do, that you must, like with everything else we're going to talk about in this series, you must think of your reader. That's the paramount thing for, for a writer to do is to think of your reader all the time. Yeah. You must just be aware that this is something that you've got to put as much work into as the plot yeah. and, and be willing to do that work. And it, you really should be fine if you do that. And it will come easier to some people than others. You know, some people write fantastic plots and the characters are, are hollow, empty shells. I've seen this 
you know, and, and vice versa. But, you yeah. know, are skills that can be learned. You know, it's and, not um, we, another skill. You can, you can improve all the time. We, we talked earlier about different types of writers and they're kind of the, the, the planners or the outliners. Right, yeah. Um, as compared to what's known as the pantsers, the, the people who think by the seats of their pants. I'm sure we've got many of both types in tonight. Um, and uh, and I, I guess for those who are doing it, kind of developing it as the story goes, so doing it by the seat of their pants, they're kind of, they're discovering things about their characters that are going along, as opposed to maybe the planners, the outliners who have thought long and hard about the individual characters up front, but the same things apply. Honestly, not, I, I, I don't want to sound like it's wrong to, to fly by the seat of your pants for your first draft, but it's not going to be as good if you, if you haven't put thought into your characterization, unless, unless you are somebody who can, who just gets it and can just do it. I mean, I don't mean, there are plenty, plenty of people out there who can, who can just get it right. But anyone can benefit by, by, um, you know, and, and you know, I use this, I've used this example in show, don't tell. And in a way it, it, it fits here that, uh, Sarah Waters, um, when she was writing Tipping the Velvet, uh, wanted to know how much you could see through a Victorian keyhole. And she went and looked through a Victorian keyhole because she wanted to be sure. But also, you know, while she was doing that, she noticed, you know, what the character yeah. probably thinking while they yes. were doing it. So, you know, the more work you put into it, the more you'll get back from doing it. So yeah. everyone's got their own way of doing it. There's plenty of people w watching today probably who are thinking, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to sit down, you know. But I, I can only, and I have this all the time with people. I, sh I, know, I know I should have done it, but I didn't. But it, you can only benefit from doing it. There's no negative to doing it. Yeah. Only yeah. It, and it will make your writing better it'll make your writing warmer and it'll make your characters more lovable or horrible or and possibly more even i guess more vested in the writing process because you start yeah you start to really uh inhabit the the, the character or, or see the character at a deeper level um a couple of quick questions now so and um, first of all I, I just put in chat the rumsfeld box there are all sorts of links just put it into google or your favorite search engine and you'll find the this i think rumsfeld did the unknown unknown unknowns unknown knowns known knowns and known unknowns um was was his the version that he was famous for of course um eileen's asked whether if a writer is a pantser so if a writer is someone who's doing it kind of you know on the fly can the profile be made before the second draft um absolutely some people feel much more comfortable with just letting the whole first draft flow out. They don't want to get, you know, caught up in anything. They just want to let this happen. Yes, absolutely. It can be made after the first draft, but not later than that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we've got a couple more questions actually coming in south. So I'm just going to ping these over if you don't mind. So, um, uh, sorry, I was figuring out the name. Ma Ma Mary Grace, I think Mary Grace. Is it all right to add more characteristics or quirks to your character as you write? I've discovered that sometimes the characters surprise me. Of course, but then what you're going to have to do is go back and read from the beginning again, because if you've, I mean, I'm being really, you know, giving a very crude example, but if you've given Uncle Timothy a limp, halfway through the book, and I know that's not what you're talking about. You've got to make sure that he's still got it at the beginning of the book, unless it, you know what I mean. Unless yeah. it happens. So, so, of course, you, the characters will start to develop as you write, but you must make sure that that, that remains consistent um, yes. throughout the story. Yeah, I've, I have heard some great stories about things left it, you know, or not, not, not realised, and you only pick them up when you go back and Mm. really re really uh check it again okay so a couple more so we, we actually had a question so this is great someone submitted a question through our um before tonight or before today uh 
following one of the emails we sent out and they asked, sorry, I haven't got the name in front of you, but it, should we base our main character on ourselves? Um, the problem I have with this is that if the character is based on me, I'm loath then to add unlikable characteristics. Or can we create characters not really based on anyone we know? So as many, many, many people here tonight will know, if you write a character based on yourself and you pretty much know you're doing that, that's called a Mary Sue. Um, the origins of which are buried far, far in the depths of the internet if anyone's interested in, in finding out. You can, of course, base your characters on yourself, and most people do, whether they're aware of it or not. If you're doing it consciously, that's quite a tricky game to play. If you're consciously putting yourself in the story, it's exactly what the person who asked that question means. You're not going to, you're going to want to, the, the, this, the characters are either going to be terribly flawed, depending on their own opinion of themselves, or absolutely perfect. It, it's a very, very dangerous game to play. You can do it, of course, but you've really got to get it right. And I would, I would say that it, it's going to happen anyway. Elements of yourself is, are going to um, slip in. You know, uh, uh, yeah. Um, you know, if, if, if you look at Sarah's book, there are certain themes that come up over and over again. You know, that, oh, most of those are reflective of, of things that's happened in her life. And um, not, not just the obvious things. But um, so it, it's a dangerous game to play if you're knowingly writing a Mary Sue. And yeah. that, that goes for blokes as well. It's still called a Mary Sue. It, it's okay. a... It's a, it's, a, it's a dangerous game to play. It can be done, but you've got to be very, very careful. Very, you've got to be very self-aware if you're going to do that. And I love this. I, I'm, I'm not a writer, and um, I'm fascinated by language and, 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 and writing, but I, I, I'm not a writer. But I, love, I learn so much in these sessions from you, so that's great. Um, so, so I've got a, a couple more I just want to throw in as well. So Susan, Susan our friend, actually, Susan in Brighton, <laughs> Uh, you mentioned working to make your characters more likable or more horrible. How do you avoid goodies and baddies or stereotypes? This is one of the things that really, that really helps bring characters to life. You are going to have your goodies. In your story, you are naturally going to have your goodies and your baddies. A baddie is much more interesting if he stops to you know, help a kitten out of a tree sometimes. That's a very crude way of saying it. A, a baddie is much more interesting. And I don't mean this, you have to be careful of tropes, of course. Yeah. There's, there is a trope of, especially with animals, actually, baddies who are nice to animals. So, you, But a baddie is much more interesting if he's not completely bad. Your perfect protagonist is going to be much more interesting if he or she gets things wrong sometimes. Yeah. And I don't mean it, you know, I don't mean the girl with the fiery temper or the man who's so too stubborn for his own good. You know, I don't mean these tropes. And I mean, of course you can do that, but it's much more interesting if, you know, actually your perfect protagonist is a bit selfish really. And the reader can see that. And if the, if the character grows through the book, and stops being like that, or at least acknowledges it, or recognises it in themselves, or gets told it by somebody, that's interesting. That's a three-dimensional character. So you don't want somebody who's all good. You don't even want somebody who's all bad, unless you are writing about a serial killer or something, and then we're talking about genre fiction. Genre fiction, what almost every genre, you are the readers come expecting your cast of characters, literally the cast of characters that you are writing. If you're writing fantasy, they are expecting literally your cast of characters. If you're writing historical fiction, they know ex exactly what they're expecting. And your challenge then is to bring something fresh to those characters, is to bring something new and different and not allow yourself to just go with every trope that there is, but to push and pull and squeeze against those. Um, so it makes characterization even more pivotal, even more of a priority for the, you know, well, to get it right. The interesting one with, say, fantasy, um, yeah. 
you know, people know exactly what they expect from a fantasy novel and they want it. They don't want you to get all clever on them. So the challenge is then to, to bring a freshness and to bring something different <clears throat> whilst sticking to this expected template. It's like, to, to go a tiny bit off, off topic just for a second, it's like with historical dialogue, they, readers of historical fiction expect historical dialogue. You know, they don't want... They don't want it to be too authentic because who can understand that? They don't want people saying, you know, that's absolutely fantastic. It's amazing. You know, blew my mind. They want historical dialogue. They want to think it's, and it's the same with characterization within genre fiction. They want a certain thing, but it's your job as a good writer to bring freshness and interest and excitement to that. Yeah, okay, and that's interesting. Nish, Nish, the apologist if I haven't pronounced your name correctly, Nish, the, um, she's asked, actually, as we're talking about the goods and bads of a character, how does this being grey develop throughout the book? And what if the development is not as per the reader's expectations? Um, so if you're, I guess, if it, I guess it's, it's your story to tell. Your, your point is about keeping the reader in, in, interested, but you should never be necessarily following a... Um, a preconceived idea of what your character does or is. I don't want grey. Yeah. You know, there is black and there is white. And, 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 and you're, the person asking the question is exactly right. You don't want grey. Nobody wants grey. So what you want is, is a blend of colours, but, yeah. but not, not sort of green and red that makes brown. You want the you want to see the green and the red. Yeah. So an interesting one here, sir. It's like, I guess it, it it is to do with characters. So Eileen's asked how many main characters, Max. So and and bit players who are not terribly minor. So she's writing a trilogy. So is there a kind of rule of thumb here, or the first rule of thumb if you if you've got a cast of thousands is you've got to give your reader space to absorb each character. If you hurl yeah. a handful of characters at them in every chapter they're not going to remember who they are and there are various ways of doing this you can give them nicknames you can give them a, a physical characteristic a scar or a beard or something like that you can give them an unusual name you can get there are various ways I, 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 it's called anchoring or tethering but you've if in, in in such a long trilogy you've got to be um so you've got to stick with your main i would say five i mean there's no rules about this just think of yourself as a reader and think of your reader you know how many people can you absorb and keep in mind and remember and as long as the peripheral characters are, are sort of drip threat fed gently by which i don't mean one every 300 pages i just mean give us a chance to get a handle on think of dickens yeah he's always all these people but he introduces them in a way that you've got time to take on each character know who they are and then you, you or you do this thing what i call sonic beeps which is sort of what i was just talking about just now i don't think you've, it's just what i call it so if if you've introduced somebody on page 22 and they don't appear again until page you know 206 you need some kind of sonic beep to to let us remember who that character is and with this kind of writing with a trilogy that can be very important so when yeah. you see the person on page 22 they've almost they've got to have a metaphorical scar you know if not a literal one so when the person walks in on on page 200 and blah and you know they've got the the scar from their nose to their cheek you know exactly who they are and it of course it doesn't have to be a scar but there has to be something so that's one of the skills of writing that kind of epic is is making sure you're managing your characters for your reader and the simple rule there is just think of yourself as a reader think of which, what, which is something we say it comes up in every session right it's single session absolutely absolutely yeah. and think about you know some Sometimes readers will take things on trust. If you think about the great Russian novels or, or, or you know, even Dickens. I mean, I tell you who's the master at doing this, whatever you think of it as J.K. Rowling. 
you know, there are so many characters in those books and, and, and you, you never get lost. She, you know, she's perfect at it. But what I was going to say about the, the great epic novels, Proust, all the rest of them, is very often a reader will just think, I, I, I'll just, I'm just going to trust that, that I'm not going to be able to remember this. This is all subconscious. I'm not going to be able to remember this. I'm just going to have to trust that it's all going to turn out all right. And we all do that a lot when we read books. We just yeah. think, I'm just going to have to trust it. It, it, you know, I'm just going to have to hope it all works out. And when it doesn't, that's when you are very disappointed in a book. But you don't want your reader to have to think like that. You want, so you want as much help as you can. It's a great point, actually, because I've definitely have, as a reader, have points where I've, I, you know, I'm kind of, I, I'm close to being confused or disinterested because I haven't got a handle on characters. And then 20 pages later, I'm completely absorbed. Um, and so, yeah, I, I get that. So, so Terry has asked an interesting question. It's not something I'm familiar with, and I don't know if you are, but he's asked, or she, sorry, have you, have you used the Enneagram to develop characters? Are you familiar with an Enneagram? I don't, luckily for me, I don't have to develop characters. Oh, um, uh, yeah, okay, this is true. But when I, I suppose, we, yeah, that, that's a good, very good point. Um, I'm only very, very, somebody else has asked me about it or has used it. Um, it's like all these things if if and it's i don't think we should get too much into what it is now again you can put it up for people but if it works for you then it's the right thing it's it's that simple yeah. the way you do it if it works for you then it's the right thing if it's if it, if you are getting full rounded characters at the end of whatever you do then it's then it's the right yeah. thing okay i don't, I, i'm good i'm it's going to work for everybody yeah yeah so there's a yeah of course an element of uh, yeah it has in everything what, what works for you might not work for the next person yeah. i'm not familiar with it so i'm going to go away and look at that afterwards it, it, they all the uh, um people here tonight can see it in the chat box referred to um so and then dwight has asked how about using a character name that is currently well known which strikes me as something that can be fraught with danger i guess to Tom Cruise. Say that again, sorry, we missed the first part. Calling a character Tom Cruise? Don't. Yeah. yeah. No. Okay. Unless, unless it's central to the character, unless, you know, everyone goes, ha, ah, Tom Cruise, you're a bit taller than he was. You know, unless it's, unless it's central somehow to the characterization, to the story, really don't. It, it, authors, sometimes do stuff like this and it's because they find it very funny and it is to them very funny but it, 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 it it's a yeah. it's very it's a joke that wears thin very quickly uh, another question related to kind of names is uh again from nishta who said is it a good idea to name your novel based on your protagonist sherlock holmes for example so i guess that's um well sherlock holmes is it's is an interesting example because it's a, such a good name. When you name a book, titles is a whole different, you know, conversation. But when you name your book, it's got to, you've got to think about it on, the, on a shelf in a bookshop or on a table in Waterstones. It's got to make you go, ooh, now Sherlock Holmes is a fantastic title. You're going to pick that book up. It's, it's so good. If it was, you know, uh, Sally Jones, you're not, you're not necessarily going to pick that up, except if you do, you're going to be expecting a chick flick, uh, not a chick, yeah. flick, a, a, a chick lit. Yeah. And that is the thing about titles. Don't, people do judge books by their titles. Absolutely. And therefore you need a title that is going to say something about the book that they pick up, or more importantly, is not going to read, lead them down the wrong path. Because yeah. it can literally be the difference between them picking, picking a book up or not picking a book yeah. up. So um, if, your t if your character is called Ebenezer Scrooge, go for it. If your character is, is called, you know, John Robertson, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it is difficult. It, it, it's about 
you know, I worked on a book once that did get published. It was a great book, uh, which was initially called The Bitter Trade of Calumny Spinks. The character was called Calumny Spinks. And I thought that was a wonderful title. And it actually, in the end, he dropped. It was just called The Bitter Trade. And I, it, to me, that sounded like um, a, a sort of historical romance novel. Whereas The Bitter Trade of Calumny Spinks was a completely different thing. And I would have picked that up the sh off the shelf. Like, yeah, I, th I, I think I, I would have. You know, so... Interesting. To think about what you're doing with your title, that's that's the main thing. Don't just fall in love with your character's name and think I'm going to call the book this. If it works, go for it. But you've yep. got to really think, there's a, whole, there's a whole set of rules about titles that you have to I was think. I say, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we could do a session just on titles alone. Um, a couple of quick questions. We're, time's moving on, so I want to get a few more questions in today before we draw to a close. Um, Quite an interesting one, this. Natalie has asked, what if you have to introduce more than five characters at once? Is there a good way of doing that? I mean, uh, is that something, again, I guess it's down to thinking from the reader's perspective, not wanting to overload them or confuse them. Um, is, is that an important point? It comes back, you can. It's not ideal at the beginning, especially at the beginning of a book. But then actually, I say that, but you could, put, everyone here could probably throw the titles of six books at me that do that. So it's just a case of, of doing it, giving the reader that breathing space. So first we meet, you know, dad, and then a few paragraphs on we meet the daughter, and then a few paragraphs on we meet the mother. And in those paragraphs, we've had time to get a sense of them and a sense of who they are and no it can be done and it can actually be done very well but you, you do have to just give think of the reader give this give enough space in between each character to, for them to be absorbed so um patricia's asked um where does a writer of historic fiction go to learn their language so i guess it's about learning the language that the character may have used and, and then featuring dialogue is there any kind of tips you can offer there Many tips. Um, it depends how far back you're going. I just I just worked on a book sent, set in the ninth century BC. So all, wow. all she could do there was work was give what people would probably think people would say. So so um, they weren't. You know, it was actually. You know, there were lots of actually very sophisticated civilizations at that time, and she was writing about one of them. But, you know, you don't want them saying, that's fantastic. You don't want them saying, you know, all the game's up. So you need, you need to sort of, if you can study your period, if there are books written in that time, read them and get a sense of the language. It might be difficult. If you're going further back, you are really going to have to think about what your reader will expect. You're going to take what you know because you will have done your research because you're writing a historical novel. So yeah. you're going to have to really, you, I mean, you want to get, it, the danger is dropping stuff in that, that's anachronistic. That's what you've got to be really care, careful of. And it's, you have to keep in mind what people in historical novels would not know. And there's so much, the further back you go, there's so much people won't know. Take away the internet, take away television, take away newspapers, take away books. You know, the, the worlds get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller mm. the further back they go. So, so it's thinking about things like that, which is as important. But if you look at Hilary Mantel, for example. Oh, I was just going to say her, one of my favourites. So, you know, that's not how people spoke in Tudor times. I know. And if, and if you did write how people spoke in Tudor times, no one would read the book. It would be impossible. But it's what we sort of think people spoke like then. And, and, that, and the same if anyone here knows Mary Reno, who writes fantastic, wrote fantastic fiction about the ancient Greeks. Um, of course, it's absolutely nothing, nothing like what, what they would have spoken, but it's yeah. our idea. So that's got to aim for that's what you've got to try and do and if you've done your research and steeped yourself in the era 
it, it shouldn't be too difficult, actually. And yeah. if you're lucky, if you're writing about 1945, there's all sorts of films made in 1945 that you can watch. There are books written in 1945 that you can read, watch them, read them. That's going to help you tremendously. Yeah, yeah, great, fantastic. So I, I, a couple more minutes. I, it, so just if anyone else got any questions they want me to put to Sally, do let me know. Um, and then a, anything else, Sally, from your point of view in terms of kind of things that you've learned in, in, in your time as a book doctor that, you know, critical tips or, or last thoughts on what people should be doing? Um, well, you're asking me, aren't you? Um, you need, what people need to be doing is making sure you've got, separate characters individual characters that's really important you don't want i've said this before tonight but it's really important you don't want the same character or the same two characters sort of cut into cookie cutter people you want individuals and you want to have <clears throat> characters that your reader will engage with and I'm, I'm, only, I'm only repeating myself because those are the two. And remember, this is really the crucial thing. Remember that, yes, the plot is probably the most important thing. But if we're saying the plot is that important thing by the power of 100, the characterization is an important thing by the power of 98. You know, it's absolutely crucial because however good your story is, you know, if we hadn't cared about Harry Potter... Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so thanks ever so much for that. Um, been really great catching up with you once again, as, as ever. I'm so glad we got the sound issues sorted. It's great to hear you clearly. Um, and I look forward to next month when we will be talking, I think, uh, let me have a quick look about pacing and structure. So thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, really appreciate you spending your time with us here. I hope you got a lot out of this evening. Um, and don't forget, you, you can contact us through the usual channels if you have any other questions that, that come into your mind after the event, um, let me know. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all uh, in a month's time. But don't forget, before then, next, uh, next Tuesday, there's a session with AJ Ogilvy as well. But Sally and I will see you in a month. Thanks, everyone.